Whoops, that's big. Can I move this? Very well. Okay. Um, let me just get this in a... No? Yes. Okay. Okay, so chapter three, energetic submarine ecosystem. Um, this is pretty much how energy gets incorporated into marine environments. Okay, um, your words are autotrophic, photosynthetic, chemosynthetic, heterotrophic, primary productivity, remember that's a rate, carbohydrates, phytoplankton, chlorophyll, thermocline, that's pertaining to heat, um, pycnocline, that's pertaining to density, and the cline is like a decline or like a, um, a change um, in the ecosystem. Um, deep chlorophyll maximum, extremophiles, remember philes means lover, uh, respiration, gross primary production, net primary production, secondary production, repeats, compensation point, algal bloom, hypoxic, ectothermic, endothermic, pyramid of numbers, pyramid of energy, pyramid of biomass. Okay, so where does all the energy of life come from? Whether you're a photoautotroph or a chemoautotroph, um, autotrophs make their own energy and then we can consume them. Auto is self, troph is feeder, or trophic level, your feeder level. Um, or your feeder position, so they are cell feeders, they can fix, or that word fix means convert, inorganic molecules, okay, not living molecules, so like sunlight, um, carbon dioxide and water into organic substances like glucose um, or cellulose or dextrose. Um, for your chemosynthetic bacteria, they're going to use water, carbon dioxide, even occasionally oxygen, um, hydrogen sulfide, and they are going to create sugars, also um, some sulfuric acid as well. Anyway, but they're using inorganic molecules to create those sugars, which are organ organic because they can keep something alive. Okay, so they can be photosynthetic, photo. Um, photo is light, and then synthesis means to make, so they're making carbohydrates with light energy. Um, this can only take place in the photic zone. The photic zone photic zone is only the first 200 meters you can see it right there it's only the first 200 meters um, of the ocean just that little yellow line up there and that's where 90 percent of our marine life is found because we're going to get so much more energy from sunlight versus using um, dissolved minerals from the earth like in chemosynthesis okay and again the food chain follows so know that like the middle of the ocean is like a wet desert because there's like nothing there there's it, there's nothing there you're not going to have areas where you're going to have nutrients being incorporated because there's no nutrients being incorporated or runoff happening in the um like open ocean now on the coastline where we have um inlets where you have rivers run running in anywhere there's runoff or um, if you have upwelling, which we haven't talked about yet, all those things will bring nutrients. Um, but sometimes too much nutrients is a bad thing. So we don't really have nutrient introduction in the open ocean. Could also be chemosynthetic. And these are organisms that create organic compounds from using chemicals like hydrogen sulfide. We need to know hydrogen sulfide. Hydrothermal vents. Um, so prior to um, 1977, they figured the only way we're going to have energy at the bottom of the ocean is if organisms sink there and then perhaps there's some bacteria down there that can decompose them. However, we put some submarines down there and found incredible climax communities. Okay, we can see all of that dissolved mineral moving up from the lithosphere. Gross worms grows. Okay, how do we transfer energy? So heterotrophs, hetero is different. Troph again is feeder, so you have to eat something different. It's not auto, you don't make it yourself in order to get energy. We can also call them consumers. They are not producers, they're not producing anything, they are consuming, they're taking in. Um, so primary productivity, how much energy is fixed or converted into carbohydrates? 
And again, that is, um, it's like a rate. Let me see if that was in the book. Primary productivity, the rate or how fast, the rate of production of new biomass through photosynthesis or chemosynthesis. Um, carbohydrates again are sugars in a one to two to one ratio of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So like C6H12O6, that's a one to two to one ratio. Your most productive marine ecosystems are gonna be estuaries because we're gonna have a lot of nutrient introduction plenty of light, it's warm, um, it's protected from a ton of wave and wind action. Um, swamps, swamps have a ton of nutrients and a lot of different feeding options in there. And then marshes. Now, overall, the oceans will be the most productive ecosystem because there is so much of it. Right, there's way more ocean than there are swamps, estuaries, and marshes. But you have those areas of the ocean that don't do anything, like the open ocean, middle of the ocean, where really nothing's going on there. Um, but because they're so big, they are the most productive because there is more of it. Photosynthesis and water. Um, your two organisms that are going to be doing this are phytoplankton. Okay, they're microscopic photosynthetic. Um, organisms that are going to live in your photic zone. Phyto and photo are all light. And then plankton means you are planktonic, that you just freely float. Um, an example of that is algae. And then we have macroalgae, big algae, and that would be like seagrass and kelp. And we have to know our full photosynthesis equation. Six carbon dioxides plus six waters in the presence of sunlight yields six oxygen molecules and one glucose molecule. We have to know that formula. You have to know it in a word form. So carbon dioxide plus water yields sugar and oxygen. Um, you also need to know it in a, a molecular formula. Phyto and zooplankton. Phyto is plant, or again, something that's pertaining to photo. And they're autotrophs. Some examples, algae. Zoo is pertaining to animals, so those are heterotrophs. The hetero is in troph, hetero, troph, different feeder. They have to eat something else for energy. Zooplankton are like tiny, tiny larvae of animals. And again, you're an animal if you're consuming something else for energy. Zooplankton will feed on phytoplankton. Planktos means to be a drifter, to be a wanderer. Um, other examples of this are crustaceans or krill. They just kind of float in the water. Um, cnidarians, like jellyfish, they're called cnidarians because they have that cnidocyst or those cnidocytes, those stinging cells. The sea is obviously silent. Chlorophyll is the green pigment found in algae and plants that do photosynthesis. Um, it's even better to call it the primary pigment in photosynthesis the primary pigment in photosynthesis. It's Greek roots, chloro is green, and phylon means leaf. So chlorophylon, chlorophyll. All right, but it is your main, your primary pigment in photosynthesis. It does not absorb green spectrum, the green wavelength of light, it does not. It absorbs red, orange, yellow, blue, and violet, and reflects back green. Okay, so I clicked the link that was on this slide. All right. It's gonna bring us to this website. So things I want you to look at. Um, it's measuring the micrograms per cubic meter of chlorophyll, okay? And where it's very green and, and dark green, um, that's where chlorophyll is high. So we're looking here, this is July. Now we're going to have a lot of chlorophyll in our higher latitudes. Longitude? No, longitude goes across. Higher latitudes. Um, plenty of nutrients, especially when the ice is melting. Any nutrients that are trapped in there, boom, they get released into your oceanic systems. And then we have light shining there. Okay, again, and things we want to look at. Again, open ocean, really no chlorophyll. No chlorophyll, no chlorophyll, no chlorophyll, no chlorophyll, no chlorophyll, no chlorophyll. Um, it's <clears throat> slim pickings there. They might have the heat, but they don't have the nutrients to do it. 
and they need nutrients. For example, um, magnesium. Magnesium is needed whenever you are making chlorophyll. Magnesium is a part of the molecule chlorophyll. Um, they need phosphorus and nitrogen so they can um, do cell division, make more DNA, and so they can do protein synthesis and make proteins and make more of themselves. Okay, and I want you to like focus also on the coastlines. Very green. <clears throat> Even places where like off Florida and off the U.S. coast, um, also the West Coast, if we go offshore, no primary productivity here, no chlorophyll. Okay, that's because we have heat, again, but we don't have any nutrients going there. Off the coast, lots of productivity because we have heat and we have nutrient runoff from freshwater systems. Okay, so let's look at in December. Notice how things kind of fluctuate. We continually move down as we get colder, but doesn't really correct anything that's going on in the middle of the ocean. That's going to stay the same. Um, no productivity up here because we're not getting any light. Also, none at the bottom. March. Things are starting to, thaw, starting to thaw out. The sun is starting to shine in our higher and lower latitudes. Um, we are having a lot of ice melting, which is releasing a lot of those trapped nutrients. Also, um, different uh, parts of the globe have different storming seasons. Storms are also going to help kick up nutrients. They are heavier, so they sink. Now we're back in June. Um, again, really cold in Antarctica, but ice is melting in the northern latitudes. Again, here's Christmas, not Christmas, but here's winter. We're only productive offshore and where the light is shining. You may see like down here, you're like, well, it is open ocean and they still have some productivity, but that's because certain currents flow that way. So nutrients are being carried that direction. Okay, so it definitely fluctuates. It's very dependent on sunlight and very dependent on nutrient amount. Okay, what's gonna affect the rate of photosynthesis or how fast things are photosynthesizing? Temperature. Um, it doesn't affect marine plants as much because our oceanic temperature is much more stable. Um, it has a higher heat capacity. Remember that from, I don't know, middle school, integrated science, biology. That means water is really good at holding its temperature. So even when it dips down to like 70 degrees here in November, the ocean will still be pretty warm. But when it's like 80 degrees in May or 85 degrees, almost 90, and we're like, dang, it's really hot, um, the ocean is probably still really cold. It holds its temperature really well, has a high heat capacity. Um, takes a lot of energy to actually change the water one degree Celsius. So it's not like, um, not like terrestrial plants or land plants. They're not as affected by temperature. Oh, sorry. Okay. Who hates yawning? Doesn't Jasmine hate yawning? It's so funny. Anyway, um, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide does not really fluctuate that much. Our carbon dioxide input in the atmosphere is through humans or animals and other animals um, respiring. So breathing out carbon dioxide because that is a byproduct of cellular respiration when we break apart sugar. Um, and then we also get it also from combustion. But we're not combusting anything in um, in the ocean. You know, maybe some engine engine um, smoke from from boats, but not enough. <coughs> um, and then all organisms are also respiring. All organisms in the ocean are giving off carbon dioxide so that they can give themselves energy. Oh goodness. Okay. Um, so. Carbon dioxide is not limiting. It is not a limiting factor in, in the ocean. Um, also with mixing between waves, it is taking in carbon dioxide that way as well. Just mixing with the atmosphere. Nutrients. Nutrients are going to be very limiting. And then you saw that 
graph from NASA that showed like mm, the open ocean has nothing going on because it's very limiting in nutrients. So plants need minerals. They also need ions to grow. A lack of them will affect their rate of growth. We'll talk way more about nutrients in the next chapter. So much fun. Um, and then we see, you know, in Florida, the Indian River Lagoon, we see the result of too much nutrients. It's like steroids for these plants. It is insane. And they will just go into those huge harmful algal blooms. <clears throat> and then light. This is our fuel source. So as light intensity starts to decrease, our rate of photosynthesis or primary productivity will also decrease. How light behaves in water. So there are reasons um, why the water is, is a certain way that it is in the ocean. Okay, um, the photic zone is the only area in the ocean that's going to have light in it. And it goes only about 200 meters deep. It's really thin. So water can both scatter and absorb sunlight. It does hold in light, but it also can scatter it. If there are a lot of waves, a lot of light is going to be reflected back because waves actually act as a lens and then they focus it back out of the water. Um, actually, it doesn't even get absorbed into the water. It just gets reflected out. So the more um, waves that we have, the more light is going to be scattered out. Um, side note from this, if there are more waves, you're also going to have more turbidity and more sediment from the bottom of the ocean or the bottom of your seafloor is going to get kicked up. That is also going to be like a double-edged sword. So not only are your waves reflecting off that light back in the atmosphere, we're also going to be stirring up a lot of sediment, making the water really cloudy. So any light that does pass now has to fight through shining through all that sediment. We call that turbidity. Um, light travels more slowly in water, and this causes refraction. To fract, like if you fracture your arm, that means to bend it. Um, even in, in just plain water, you know, distilled water, H2O, no salt, no sugar, nothing like that, um, light will bend. And that's why, you know, if we have an object in our water, it may look like it's magnified. If we have a straw in our water, it might look like it's bent a little bit. Um, the colder the water is, the slower the light's going to travel. The hotter the water is, the faster it's going to travel. And that's just kinetic energy thing. Um, salt. So it's not just water particles. It's not just H2O floating around that the light has to try and go through. If it's salt water, now it has to try and pass through H2O and sodium chloride, NaCl. Um, and that's not the only types of salts that are in the ocean. Remember, salts are a metal and a non-metal together. So in this, I love this. I think this picture is crazy. You know, his head is obviously not cut off um, or anything like that. This is just in the polar bear standing right here, not over here. It looks that way because light is traveling so much slower. This water is very cold. This water is very dense. Um, it has a lot of salt and a lot of particulate matter in there. So that is going to cause the light to look like it's bending. Okay. Um, as light absorption increases, the temperature is going to increase. That should make sense because it's going to make the water warmer. As temperature starts to increase, your particles start moving faster. Your particles in the water, your water particles, your salt particles, so they're going to start to absorb temperature and absorb thermal heat from the light. So the kinetic energy or the moving energy of the particles is going to increase. Now, this kinetic energy, all that warm water, I mentioned it before, warm things rise because they have more energy and they just move to the top. Colder things, colder water, colder air, it's like slow and they don't have a lot of kinetic energy and they sink. So as temperature is going to increase, we're going to cause the water to become less dense. Things that are warm are less dense than things that are cold. This causes warm water to float on top of cold water. In the ocean, warm water floats on top of the cold water. This is called a thermocline. Here's a thermocline. Now, this also, and you don't need to look at all these other ones. I'm just looking over here at the thermocline. This will cause density stratification or density layering. My top of the water, okay, my photic zone, has a lot of sunlight on it. It's absorbing a lot of heat energy. 
It's making this, these particles, these water particles warmer. They are less dense. They're going to float. Deep water is not going to get any light. So it's going to stay very dense and cold, and it's going to stay sinking. This creates a thermocline. Please sketch these out if you haven't already. You have to know these. Okay, a pycnocline. The thermo is pertaining to thermal energy. A pycnocline, pycno is density. So this is a transition between low density and high density water. Here's your pycnocline. So it's, it looks like it's backwards of the thermocline, but that's because what you don't see here is, is different temperatures. So up here might be like 38 degrees Celsius, and over here will be zero. It is important to know that the thermocline never touches the axis. Because it's zero degrees Celsius, water is frozen. The bottom of our ocean is not frozen. So temperature will continue to decrease, but it can never touch the axis. The pycnocline. We're measuring density here. So here, the density is low or at zero, and as we increase, the density is getting higher. Well, because the water is warm at the surface, it's less dense, and then its temperature is going to start to decrease, so it's gonna pick up its density. Um, and then it's going to be way more dense and way more colder towards the bottom of the ocean. In addition, you will have nutrients in the water, but nutrients are particulate matter, particles sink. So that makes the density difference even larger because particles have some mass to them and they will sink. Okay, so there's very little mixing between these two because you would need a really, really strong energy source like wind to cause that warm water to mix with the cold water. The benefit of that is you are getting nutrients nutrients from the more of the depths in the ocean because that causes it to be more dense it's heavier so it's going to sink that will cause nutrients to move up but the mixing is also going to push warm water down that's not good because if we have phytoplankton at the top <clears throat> and phytoplankton is being pushed down now they're away from sunlight so yeah they're gonna you know they might have access to nutrients down here in the more the deeper waters, but without sunlight, they don't have a, an energy source to start. So it, it's not helpful. Now, the thermocline is super influential because it allows the phytoplankton to stay on top of the water column. Phytoplankton don't swim. <clears throat> Again, they're planktonic, so they float. We don't want them sinking. They're our primary producers in the ocean. We don't want them sinking. If they sink, they're not gonna have access to sunlight. They don't swim, they're not gonna be able to come back up and they're just gonna die. And so we're gonna lose our primary producers here. And the benefit is they'll be around nutrients, but that's no good if you don't have any light to fuel it. It's like putting oil in your car, but you don't have gasoline. So what's the point? You're not going anywhere anyways. Sketch these out as well. Okay. Okay. Um, why are there different thermoclines? Because of seasons. Okay. Because of different seasons. So in low latitudes, let's say around our equator, the sun energy is much stronger. The density difference is much greater. Okay, so between where the sun isn't going to shine, so at my aphotic zone, right? Right here is about 200 meters. And then down here, like there's a big density difference, huge density difference. We can see it. This is the thermocline. This line right here is the thermocline. Um, again, it's, it's never touching the axis ever, even in our high latitude, it's not gonna touch the axis. That would mean it's zero degrees Celsius and it would be frozen. But in, at, around the equator, the sun energy is so much stronger in, at the surface. So that's going to cause the water to be much warmer. Mid-latitudes, um, it's gonna be up by New York or up by Maine. That sun energy is not as great as it is at the equator. Therefore, my um, surface waters are not as warm, of course, right? It's not the tropics. So we see here, it's about 25 degrees Celsius. Right here, we're looking at about, I don't know, 15, 13 um, degrees Celsius. 
that and this line can go a little bit deeper you know notice that it's a little bit deeper than over here in your low latitudes the difference is the density difference the mid latitudes don't have as big as a density difference and it's density like that idea that the kinetic energy is really high at the surface and really low in the depths the density difference keeps this thermocline there density is dependent on temperature and on pressure and how many particle you particles you have per area higher latitudes doesn't matter <laughs> um so this would be like at the poles our sun really is not strong enough up there to change this a degree celsius so my surface waters are going to remain cold even when the ice starts to melt it's going to remain cold it's really cold fresh water being put there and so we really don't see a big density difference or a thermocline or anything that's going to keep phytoplankton floating. Okay. Why do we need a thermocline? Without the density gradient, there would be a lot more mixing, and then your phytoplankton will sink, like I mentioned. If they sink, they're not in the photic zone, therefore no photosynthesis. If there's no photosynthesis, we're going to have really low primary productivity and no food. But generally, the deeper waters have more nutrients. Even though it's just little particulate matter, nutrients have mass and they will sink. That's it. Like they're going to sink because they have mass. Things with mass are going to sink. Um, and their mass obviously has to be greater than the density of the water particles and salt particles. They have to be like atomically heavier for them to sink. Okay, so our deeper waters are gonna have more nutrients. The thermocline will prevent nutrient-rich waters from mixing with the surface layers, which causes low productivity. Again, that's why we didn't see much productivity or any uh, chlorophyll at all in the middle of the ocean in that graph you guys saw a little bit ago. <coughs> um, there's no nutrients there. And there is no wind strong enough to mix in the middle of the ocean nutrient that's in the deep water to the top. That won't happen. Maybe like over a hurricane, but you're not gonna have a ton of sun out there either. And and then again, your phytoplankton is gonna be pushed down to the depths. It won't be around sunlight, and then it sucks. Sketch this out. Know why this is why it is. Okay. Surface waters have a lot of light. They have low nutrients because nutrients sink. Deep waters, light does not penetrate that far. Nutrient amount high. Okay, so the deep chlorophyll maximum. So there is going to be an area where productivity is the highest. It's close to the thermocline. Again, here is our thermocline. Here is a thermocline. All right. There is enough light for photosynthesis, and there is enough nutrients for growth. This is called the deep chlorophyll maximum. Okay, it's not in the deep, deep water. Okay, but it's below the main photic zone and it has nutrients there. Deep chlorophyll maximum. This is where chlorophyll is at its maximum. Oh! Okay, let's see what we're looking at here. Okay, I'm gonna ignore what says iridescence because that's not really going to help our situation. Let's first identify our thermoclines. This is going to be the gradient between different types of waters, the, the boundary in your water layers between different temperatures of waters. Okay, so thermocline is right here, okay, and it's temperature. It's our dotted line. Here it falls. High at the top because we have a lot of sunlight. The sun's going to shine through, so this keeps this water warm. Warm water floats on top of cold water. Here is where we start to see a change in temperature. This is because light is not able to shine as far. And then we continue to have a gradual temperature decline. It cannot touch the axis. That means that it's frozen and that doesn't happen. Okay, here's my thermocline. This part right here is the thermocline, the decline of heat energy. 
If we look at nutrients, nutrients are very low in the surface layer, very low, because they, they have mass. They're going to start to sink, 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 sink. And if we look at chlorophyll, chlorophyll is not at zero, but it is low at the surface. Though they have light, they're lacking nutrients. And chlorophyll is going to start to spike right here. A chlorocline. I made that up. It's not real. It's going to start to spike right here. Right here. So this is where we're getting some nutrient um, input in that, in that layer, in that thermocline layer. And the sun is still shining in this area. Okay. And here is our maximum. Here is the deep chlorophyll maximum right here. So it did say in your notes... Um, it's typically around the thermocline. This is where productivity is the highest. Okay, so we still have sunlight shining here, not as much as the top, but enough. And we also have nutrients. Here's our nutrients. And so because these two lines are kind of coming together and they're still in a decent amount, we can have a lot of chlorophyll here. Chlorophyll tells you that your plants are doing photosynthesis. Your producers are doing photosynthesis. And then it starts to decline, um, not because of nutrients, but this time it's declining because of sunlight. I think it's helpful to draw this out. This for me is a college class. I would draw it out. You do not need to include iridescence. Um, I would do chlorophyll in a green line, temperature in a red, and maybe nutrients in orange, blue. I don't care. Okay. Two ways which new biomass is produced in the ocean, chemophoto. Display my productivity is limited to the first 200 meters in depth. Sunlight. Chemosynthesis. Ugh, I have 30 more slides. That's okay. Okay, so this captures the chemical energy of dissolved minerals and turns them into carbon dioxide and organic molecules like carbohydrates. There's several different species that can fix hydrogen sulfide into carbohydrates. Again, that word fix means convert. Convert. Bagiatoa was one of the answers to your um, vocab quiz today. If you haven't taken it, there is no extra credit on retakes because I, by that time you could have shared them with each other and I'm telling you right now. So these are just long, thick bacteria that form like orange mats. Their job is to fix sulfur compounds. So like hydrogen sulfide, that is a sulfur compound to convert sulfur compounds. That's what it looks like. Theothrix is another long bacteria that can fix sulfur compounds into carbohydrates. Boom. Um, now, it's not just hydrogen sulfide that comes out of the vents. There are other dissolved minerals. Um, each one may use a different formula. I'll read you what's out of the book. Um, so it says there's several species of chemosynthetic bacteria, including Vegetoa and Theothrix species. Each species uses different chemicals as their energy source and produces different sugars. One common pathway is hydrogen sulfide plus oxygen plus carbon dioxide makes sugar, water, and sulfur. Um, there is not enough understood about chemosynthetic ecosystems um, to give them like one generic formula. They do use different energy sources. The one you're going to need to know is hydrogen sulfide. Sorry. Ooh, draw this. Draw this, draw this. Okay, so we have our hydrothermal vent. Hydrogen sulfide is coming out. Water is going in, carbon dioxide is going in. They get carbon dioxide down here, just like any other part in the ocean, because organisms like tube worms, even bacteria, um, different species of fish and crabs, they are going to be respiring. They release carbon dioxide. Oh, goodness. Um, the mussels that live there, the mussels that live there, I'll read you out of the book as well. This chapter two discusses the symbiotic relationship between giant tube worms, riftia species, and chemosynthetic bacteria. Up to 75% of animal species at hydrothermal vents depend on a mutualistic relationship um, with chemosynthetic bacteria for at least some of their food. So 
rely on having a mutualistic relationship with that bacteria. Therefore, 75% of the organisms there have that chemosynthetic bacteria inside their bodies. For example, mussels at these vents, we got some mussels here, have mutualistic bacteria living in their gills, but they also, also filter feed. There's just not enough particulate matter for them to be filter feeding. Tube worms also like suck in nutrients. They also filter feed. Again, not enough um, nutrients or not enough um, organic material to actually filter feed and be successful with it. Therefore, they have to have that mutualistic bacteria inside of them. <clears throat> okay, so Tevnia is your pioneer species. Riftia is your climax community species. They have a symbiotic relationship with chemosynthetic bacteria. Push yourself to continually write chemosynthetic bacteria um, whenever you're writing about bacteria in hydrothermal vents. Specifically, many MARC schemes request chemosynthetic, chemosynthetic. Because we have bacteria inside of our bodies, they are not chemosynthetic. Okay, the bacteria will provide nutrients to Riftia. These are Riftia, these red and white, long, lovely worms. Okay, the species that live here are extremophiles. File means lover of. Um, they're able to extreme ex survive extreme temperatures. Um, temperatures ranging between, give you a specific answer, two degrees Celsius. It's really cold, it's almost frozen, right? Zero degrees Celsius is frozen. Um, two degrees Celsius. And that's going to be places that are away from the actual vent to 400 degrees Celsius. At 100 degrees Celsius, water boils. So this is four times the boiling temperature. And that's from the water actually coming out of the vent at the bottom of the ocean. And it's so hot, it dissolves minerals that are in the lithosphere of the crust, the Earth's crust, and it brings them out into the bottom of the ocean. And those dissolved minerals help the help the bacteria do chemosynthesis okay so they're able to withstand really extreme temperatures from two degrees celsius almost freezing to 400 degrees celsius four times boiling point also <clears throat> salt increases the temperature of boiling point so it wouldn't exactly be 100 that's just for fresh water also pressure increases boiling point okay um they have extreme pressure, so about 300 atmospheres. Um, they have extreme amounts of salinity. Um, so there's, and salinity is not just dissolved salts, it's dissolved minerals. And there's so many dissolved minerals here. It's literally coming from the particulate matter of the Earth's crust. And that water is so hot that it easily breaks it down and dissolves it. Also, they have a really low pH, which means there is a high acid there. Low pH is very acidic. Sulfuric acid is one of the things that they create. Okay, chemo versus photo. I would copy this. What do they both use? They both use carbon dioxide, they both use water. They are both an energy, they both need an energy source. They both produce sugars or carbohydrates. The sugars are used for them to do respiration or for them to do metabolism with their own body. Chemosynthesis specifically, um, the byproducts or what they're giving off, it does depend on what chemicals are being used. For example, if they're using hydrogen sulfide, one of the byproducts is gonna be sulfuric acid. This is done by mutualistic bacteria, or bacteria that have a mutualistic relationship with those tube worms, the Riftia tube worms, um, chemosynthetic bacteria, mutualistic chemosynthetic bacteria. Um, you can't just say bacteria because there are some like cyanobacteria that do also photosynthesize. So it has to be chemosynthetic bacteria. Okay, and chemosynthesis occurs at hydrothermal vents. Photosynthesis produces glucose, C6H12O6. It's done by green plants and algae, even macroalgae like kelp. It's produced, this happens in the photic zone. Oxygen is a byproduct. Okay, I would copy this too. What's your energy source for chemophoto? What are the products that are created? What types of organisms do this? And where is this happening in the ocean? Okay. Respiration is the process which all living things release energy stored in chemical bonds of glucose, or organic materials. And that is how we get out ATP. 
The energy will carry out all metabolic reactions for the organism. RxN is my way of writing out reactions. Okay, so respiration happens in every single cell of our body. Some cells have do this way more, like your muscle cells, your heart, your brain. Um, those cells have mitochondria. The mitochondria break apart the sugar that you eat after your blood has sent it to the, those cells. Breaks apart the sugar that you eat. And then as it breaks that apart, right? Remember chemical sunlight energy, light energy was stored in the chemical bonds that held glucose together. Well, now that's being converted to adenosine triphosphate or ATP. And that's just a bio concept there. Um, all living things do this. ATP is the energy source for living organisms, for bacteria, for animals, um, other consumers, for plants. They need ATP, fungus. Okay. Respiration also produces heat, and this gets lost to the environment. That's not efficient. Our job is not to be producing heat, it's to give ourselves ATP, but heat is a byproduct. Okay, this takes place in the mitochondria of the cell. The formula is glucose, so C6H12O6 plus 6O2, oxygen, yields six water molecules and six carbon dioxides and 36 ATPs, about, adenosine triphosphate molecules. Um, so we breathe out the leftovers from that. We breathe out carbon dioxide, we breathe out water. Um, that's why we like, like breathe on our glasses because we're just condensing water molecules on there. When it's cold, your water molecules condense as soon as you breathe. Okay, I mentioned this today before your quiz, the difference between gross primary production and net primary production. Producers need to use their own food source, their own carbohydrates to give themselves energy. So 100% of the biomass or the organic material that they make cannot go to the consumer when the consumer eats them because the producer is going to use it to stay alive and do its daily producer things. So gross primary production is like your total. It's the amount of light or chemical energy converted or fixed by producers in a given time for a given area. So it's total biomass. And this would be like, again, at my example in class, you make $10 an hour, you work 40 hours a week, you should gross $400 for that week, but you're not going to. You're going to net maybe 300, maybe 275. Um, so net primary production is what's left over. It's the amount of energy left over for new biomass for another organism to use that for their own mass after respiration has been taken into account. This is what the consumers get, the primary consumer. The primary consumer gets what is left over from the producer after it kept itself alive and did respiration. So your formula is the net primary production, what your first consumer is gonna get, is the total amount that your producer made minus what your producer used to do respiration and keep itself alive. <laughs> secondary production so like primary production this is another rate scenario it's another like speed or how fast it's the rate of production of new biomass by consumers using the energy gained from eating the producer so your primary consumer eats the producer okay and now this is like how fast can that consumer use that energy to build itself and to add biomass to itself. The more productive your ecosystem is, the more primary production there is, the more energy that will go up your food chains. So if you have a lot of primary production, you are definitely going to have a lot of secondary production. How can we measure productivity? So we could look at the, the rate of photosynthesis by producers. That's what primary productivity is. We can see how fast they do it. We could look at the increase of biomass of the producers. Remember to do that, we just need to like evaporate out the water and then we can weigh the actual living mass, the living tissue. Or we can look at the amount of chlorophyll in an ecosystem. The units to measure gross primary production and net primary production are Air, um, amount of energy per unit area over time. So the amount of energy in an area over a certain period of time. 
So our energy is kilojoules, kilojoules per meter squared. That's my area in a year. That's my time. Could also write it like this. Remember with the negatives, that means that you're taking it out of the fraction. Measuring the rate of photosynthesis. Okay, so this was the first one. How can we do this? We can measure the rate of photosynthesis by producers. <clears throat> um, if photosynthesis is occurring, we are going to have a lot of oxygen. That is one of the byproducts of photosynthesis. If respiration is occurring, we're going to have a lot of carbon dioxide. Brings us to the compensation point. <clears throat> So there is a point where photosynthesis and respiration are going to equal. Your producers also have to do photosynthesis. That sounded stupid, duh. Your producers also have to do respiration because now they have this carbohydrate, they need to extract energy from it, you know, commence cellular respiration and you can get energy out of that. But there is going to be a point or a depth in the ocean where your producers are going, to, it's going to be a wash. They're making all this, um, all these carbohydrates from photosynthesis, but yet they're using it all in respiration to keep themselves alive. So they really have no energy left over. That's not good for your trophic levels because we will, they might still consume these producers, yet there's nothing to gain energy wise. So... Below this point, below this compensation point, shit, hold on a second, first we're not probably ready to be, okay, <clears throat> excuse me, below this depth, light is still available, but it is not strong enough to continue doing photosynthesis well. Um, their respiration isn't going to stop, though. They don't respire necessarily more if they're at the top or more if they're at the bottom, like, they're going to respire no matter what, like, same thing with us. Our respiration doesn't change throughout the day. You know, unless we're exercising, our respiration pretty much stays the same. But the day doesn't necessarily change that. So below the compensation point depth, they will have light. It will not be enough to do photosynthesis. However, they still will be trying to keep themselves alive. Therefore, they are using more of their energy source to keep themselves alive than they are making. That puts them in a huge productivity and biomass debt. And they're going to die. Um, above this, you're fine. Above this, you're fine. Your sunlight is good enough. So though there is light, it's not good enough. This is called the dysphotic zone. Remember if dys is in front of something that is like a negative connotation to it. So we have the photic zone or the dysphotic zone. 90% of marine life is found um, about the compensation point in the euphotic zone. Found about? I don't think that should say that. I believe it should say found around. Above. Above, 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 above. This is called a dysphotic zone. 90% of marine life is found above the compensation point in the euphotic zone. You, like eukaryote, remember, you means good. You also means true in Latin or Greek. So this is the good photic zone, the good sun zone, or the true sun zone. Dysphotic, bad. Negative sun zone. All right, so be prepared for the question. Why is 90% of marine life found above the compensation point? Or why can producers not survive below the compensation point? Ooh! this one okay here's our compensation point right here here is production right primary production we produce a good deal at the surface most right here we'll have a little bit of nutrients and then sunlight's going down watch over here sunlight's going down sunlight goes down photosynthesis is going to go down go down go down go down go down until there's no more sunlight okay this blue line is respiration it does not matter where your photosynthesizers are. They are going to respire here, 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 here. Nothing's going to make them do it faster. Just That's just how they live their life. So respiration is going to stay constant with depth because depth does not influence that. Production is going to decrease with depth because light influences that. 
Where they meet is your compensation point. Production is equaling respiration. Below this, respiration, trying to stay alive is greater than production. So you will just waste away and then they will die. Up here though, this is where a majority of organisms can be found. This is the euphotic zone, the good photic zone. Yes, I would draw that. Um, how can we measure the amount of chlorophyll? So we can use satellite imagery. And I'm again, I'm going back to this, this side. I said, how do we measure productivity? We just talked about looking at the rate of photosynthesis, um, looking at the rate of biomass in producers, and now looking at the chlorophyll in the ecosystem. So here's measuring the rate of photo. We can use satellite imagery like we did in the beginning of the notes. It's very high in the tropics and in the higher latitudes because you have nutrient rich water mixing running off of the running off of the coastlines. You also have nutrients running off glaciers. Low nutrient waters are due to poor mixing with deep waters. Um, typically, I, it's caused by wind patterns, and I did mention that. So like down here, yeah, it's in the open ocean, but you have really good currents, wind currents causing mixing of the waters. Um, it's almost like a water conveyor belt underneath. <sighs> um, where we see it is like this deep blue. It's very poor mixing. There's our trade winds in the middle. Very good mixing there. Okay. So satellites can only show like a shallow, a shallow depth of chlorophyll. Um, they cannot show the entire euphotic zone. Okay. Obviously, you don't need to do this in 10,000 words or less. Um, productivity changes in the food web. So the higher productivity, the more primary production you have, photosynthesis, the more biomass you're going to have or living tissue, the higher the population of consumers, the longer the food chain. If you are producing more, the consumers or the feeders will come. Your most productive areas are going to be high nutrients from upwelling, Okay, and I'll talk about upwelling. Here's a picture of upwelling. So when you have offshore winds, it's coming from off the shore, right? Here's land. Pushing water towards the ocean, pushing it away from the, the coast, pushing it away from the shoreline, pushing the water away. That's going to cause um, a gap right here. Why can't I? I want to... I want to, um, you know, have like a little laser pointer or something. I don't know. So this water is going to be pushed. Now we're going to have this area of emptiness, empty water. Not for long. Like you would not be able to even, you couldn't see this happening. Water is getting pushed away. Meanwhile, something has to take its place. So nutrient, cold, nutrient-rich water from the deep upwells and takes the place of the surface water. Because something has to take that place. There's a gap. Something will fill it. Again, there's nutrients at the bottom of the ocean because nutrients have mass and they're going to sink. This is upwelling. This is when you're going to see all those humpback whales off the coast of California, like all surfacing to the top. There's a ton of krill there. There's always seabirds. That is an area of strong upwelling. We really don't have a lot of upwelling at all in Florida. That's just not the way the winds blow. So we have offshore winds pushing, 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 pushing our surface waters. Now we have this pocket of like, we need water here. Water has to take its place. So water from the bottom will come up. And this water at the bottom has a ton of nutrients. It comes to the surface. That is upwelling. Um, tropical areas with high sunlight. Um, but it's also really warm. So there's a strong thermocline. So you're not going to have a lot of mixing or a lot of nutrients. The blood sword. Um, polar regions, they have a lot of nutrients, um, but in the summer is the only time that they can really do photosynthesis. Okay, so most productive areas. Areas high nutrients from upwelling. Tropical areas because they have a lot of sunlight, but they don't have much nutrients because that stays down because of that huge density difference in temperatures. And polar regions, but they don't always have sunlight. 
here we can see lots of primary productivity happening. Anywhere we have um, a coastline with runoff. Very good, very good. <clears throat> Too much is a bad thing. Look at my lovely arrows. <clears throat> so productivity can be too high, right? We see this all the time in the Indian River Lagoon. So if nutrients simply increase, that means phytoplankton will increase. That is called an algal bloom. Algal bloom is a rapid increase in the population of algae. Why is this bad? Too much algae can block the gills of fish. Like just cake it on there. Can block the gills of fish. As algae die, they sink. Bacteria has to decompose them, okay? And bacteria now has this awesome food source. So that's gonna cause the bacteria population to explode. Now, it, we're now talking about like the bottom of your water. Algae sink, phytoplankton sink, they need to be decayed and broken down, decomposed by bacteria. Um, okay, I'm gonna go to this bullet right here. If you have an increase in bacteria, that means that they are going to be doing cellular respiration a lot. They're going to be doing cellular respiration to help them with metabolism and consumption to give themselves energy. They're going to be doing cellular respiration so that they can do um, binary fission, cell division for bacteria and split apart. So I'll recap. As algae dies, the back, they sink. Bacteria will decompose them. This in increases the bacteria population. Last bullet. If we increase bacteria, we're going to increase bacterial growth and respiration of the bacteria, right? Because they want to keep growing and, and decomposing. Respiration requires oxygen. That's why we have to have oxygen. All living things have to have oxygen because they have to do cellular respiration. The bacteria are going to use up so much oxygen that's there so that they can break this down and they can de decompose and do their job. That's going to cause a hypoxic situation. So we're gonna lose oxygen for the remaining food chain because the bacteria are taking it all to decompose the algae. Well, the algae aren't there anymore doing photosynthesis because they died. So now our oxygen inputs are gone. The oxygen that was in the water is now being used up by bacteria. No good. So this leads to hypoxia. Um, another, word, another way to say hypoxic is to say anoxic anoxia with an A. So it's very low concentration of oxygen. Um, back to your second to last bullet, too much algae can also block out the sun entirely from the water. Um, so that sucks for any seagrasses or kelp that would like to get sunlight. Your algae is going to cause this like thick mat on top and that's not going to happen. Make sure we understand this. Make sure you understand this. Another way to call this is called eutrophication. U spelled E-U, trophic. T-R-O-P-H-I-C-A-C-A-T-I-O-N. A -C -A -T -I -O -N. Eutrophication. So when there's too much nutrients, it causes an algal bloom. The algae dies. They need to be decayed. The bacteria that are decaying them are using up all of the oxygen, and it creates a hypoxic water situation. Know this slide. If we need to explain more, we can explain it more, but we need to know why algal blooms are bad. We need to know why too much nutrients is a problem. We need to know what leads to hypoxia. If the algae also, some algae also make harmful toxins and this can poison other fish. This can poison people who eat fish. This could cause mass mortality for dolphins. Um, organisms higher in the food chain where those toxins are going to bioaccumulate and they're just going to build and build and build in their bodies. Um, right now I know a lot of like shell animals, um, mussels and clams and, uh, oysters, they're filter feeders. So they will also filter through this toxin and have that inside of their body tissues. They also have microplastics inside their body tissue because of plastics in our ocean. Um, some of these toxins, I can't, I think it was caused from brown algae, but it was a neurotoxin and it caused the manatees here to not get that response, that like physiological response that they need to surface and take some, take in some oxygen and breathe. So that toxin like caused them to never surface. And so they ended up just dying and suffocating. 
Okay. This is from, these are all Florida. All these are Florida. Look how thick that is. Hard for light to pass through that. It's gross. Okay. Only a small amount of the sun's energy is fixed by producers. One second while you're writing this. I'm going to read you the question that is typically a struggle for students. Hold on now. I think I'm getting there. 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 Ah! Uh, sorry. Um, I can't think of where it is. Well, the question asked: Explain why um there's a limit. Is this it? No. Okay. Explain why there's a limit to um, the wavelength that can be absorbed by plants or explain why not 100% of the energy that is sent to the ocean um, is absorbed by plants, something like that. So you have to know these factors. Um, typically a three mark question. Okay, so of the sun energy that comes in, some is reflected back to space. It never even makes it to the ocean. However, I know this question specifically says of the energy that makes it to the surface. Of the energy that makes it to the surface, why isn't all of it incorporated? Just trying to see if I can't find it or not. I'd like you to have it. Um, reason why. Some of it is absorbed by the water. Water is a greenhouse gas, so it does absorb energy. It does absorb thermal energy, it does absorb solar energy. Um, some of it is reflected or scattered by the water and particles. Water scatters light. Water also absorbs light. Um, particles, they mean like anything that's contributing to the salinity, not just salt, but all the particulate minerals in there. That also causes light to scatter. It's like it's interfering with it almost. And again, if there's a lot of wave action, that light gets reflected back off because the wave acts like a lens. Some of the light is in the wrong wavelength. It's in the green wavelength, and that is not going to work. That doesn't work for, um, for photosynthesizers. They need that green light is not helpful. Hmm. And someone's gonna miss the chloroplast. Literally. Like what a simple question. Let me. I'll show you like what that means they're, they're going to miss the chloroplast. It's such a simple answer. Not a question. Simple answer. Okay, I'm back. Um, so here is a um, microscopic picture of, or a microscope picture um, from a light microscope of plant cells. You can tell it's a plant because it's green. The only reason why it shows green is because it has a pigment chlorophyll. Otherwise, there's no other parts of the cell that need to have color. Um, blood cells have color because they have hemoglobin. Anyway. The third reason for this was some of the light will miss the chloroplast. And it's like such a like microscopic point, but it's true. You know, if light is shining through and it just misses this, like it's not going to get absorbed. It has to hit a chloroplast. And then, you know, the, the energy in the thylakoids will take over. But if it goes in any of these gapped areas, that's not, it's not going to get absorbed. So. Some, some of the sunlight misses the chloroplast. It's, it's a simple answer, but that's what they're talking about. It does not hit the green area. Um, I found that question. So it says, blah, blah, blah. Here's a food chain. It's from 2017. So you have a food chain. Okay. Then I'll read the question. 
of the light energy from the sun that falls on the water. So that means this first bullet, it's reflected into space, never makes it to the ocean. That's already gone. Can't ask, can't use that as an answer. Um, of the energy that falls into the water, only 3% becomes incorporated into the phytoplankton. Suggest three reasons why 3% of the energy is incorporated into the phytoplankton. Okay, answer. Some light is reflected by the water. Some light is absorbed by the water or scattered by water and the particles that are there. Some wavelengths are not compatible for photosynthesis or it's in the wrong wavelength, for example, green. Some light does not hit the chlorophyll or the chloroplast. Chlorophyll is inside the chloroplast. And only 3%, also because it's not 100% efficient. To do photosynthesis, it costs energy. So it, it is not 100% efficient. So nothing is 100% efficient. So that's the question. Do not skip this slide. You need to know why not all the light is incorporated. And energy is lost as heat. Okay. Energy transfer to the consumers. Net primary production goes to consumers when they ingest, digest, or absorb nutrients. So we have gross primary production done by the phytoplankton and the seaweed, um, but they're gonna use some of that for energy. So whatever's left over is what the crabs will net when they eat the seaweed, what the krill will net when it eats phytoplankton, what the zooplankton will net whenever they eat the phytoplankton. Okay. Another detail that, you know, sometimes we don't think about. When eating phytoplankton, the whole cell is consumed and it's absorbed. So you get all of that biomass. But when you're eating seagrass or kelp, you're not eating the whole organism. You're just eating a little bit of it. So you're only, you're not getting, you know, 10% of the seaweed energy. You're getting way less than that because you're not eating that whole organism. You're just eating parts of it. There also are some parts that are not digestible. For example, the roots. Um, for a whale to eat the elephant seal, there are parts that are not digestible. It will not digest the fur. Not, I'm not saying it's, it'll die. I mean, it's going to eat the fur and it's going to poop the fur out. It's not going to be able to digest the fur. Um, you know, it's like cats cough up hairballs. It is not going to be able to digest bone material. So, and, but... But that doesn't mean that the, and those whales not getting all of the net primary production or the net secondary or tertiary production. It, it could. When the elephant seal eats, it's using a lot of energy to grow more fur, make itself fatter, um, you know, increase its blubber and, and grow its organism. So when the killer whale goes to eat it, it is not going to be get, getting all that energy because some of that energy was put into growing its bone structure. Um, some of that energy was gone into creating more fur and the whale can't digest that. So it's not going to get all of that energy either. So it's something to consider. Um, roots are not ingested whenever, you know, the crabs eat seaweed. It's not. So the difference between phytoplankton and seaweed um, and then other organisms is digestible material. Are you really eating the whole organism? Are you really getting 100 percent of that? Um, the roots will eventually, and, and same with the elephant seal, it's fur and it's bones, you know, when the whale excretes or, um, sorry, has egestion and it poops and it gets rid of its, its waste material that is going to sink. You will have detritivores and you will have decomposers who are able to break that down and then incorporate those materials back into the food, um, or the trophic levels back into your food web. So eventually the roots will break apart and be part of the food web. That's when the plant's gonna die. Um, decomposers will come over, decompose it, break it down into its tiny little building blocks, small amino acids, small proteins, um, small nucleic acids, small carbohydrates, small lipids, and that can get reabsorbed again. Secondary production. Um, look at this, what a beautiful angelfish. So this is new biomass made by the producers. So uh, not by the consumers, right? When the consumers eat the producers. So secondary production for me would be like if I ate an entire plant, roots and all, I ate the entire plant. 
it would be like how much I am incorporating into my new biomass, into growing my person. So the new biomass made by consumers depends on what was available in the producer. So what did you eat? Um, the amount of energy lost in respiration by the consumer. So I'm gonna eat this entire plant. My body's going to use some of that energy to keep me alive and doing my things that I need to be doing. Um, so that it takes into account the energy lost by respiration and the energy lost in waste and urine. So some of this part of the plant, I am like the water that's in it, I'm going to urinate out. The parts that I cannot digest, like the cellulose, we can't digest that, that will be ejected out. So then whatever is left, whatever that was in that producer that I didn't use for my own respiration and I did not pee or poop out, like that is what will be ready for me to use to make more of myself and to do cell division, to grow my biomass, my living tissue, my living mass. Um, saltwater fish, they rarely urinate because they're gonna try and keep all of the water that they have inside of them because it's really salty on the outside. Um, a lot of times when they're trying to get rid of like ammonia waste or like nitrogenous waste, we release ammonia in our urine, but they will release ammonia through their gills. It's just in a gaseous form. Ammonia is NH3. Goodness gracious. I want to be done with the notes. So much more. Oh my gosh. Not much more. Okay. We can do this. 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 All right. Calculating energy transfer. I hope you appreciate that I color coded these for you so you know what they are. So, energy consumed. We're typically gonna be solving for P, right? We wanna see what the, the secondary production is. How much am I gonna have to make my person? <clears throat> so this is really gonna be the energy that I'm gonna get when I consume a producer or when I consume a consumer. This is gonna be the amount of energy that I get. So C is gonna be the energy consumed, all right? So I eat the entire zebra. I eat the whole zebra, the whole thing. I eat it all. That's what energy I put inside me, okay? Um, energy loss and respiration is R. Energy loss in feces or egestion is F. Energy lost in urine is U and P is going to be left over. And typically we're solving for P. So P is going to be what I get to use to make more of myself. Okay, we can practice these in class. I'm just reading it. I can see 112 kilojoules of energy. So that's my C, um, 70, 78 kilojoules using respiration. There's my R, 20 is lost as waste. Ah, okay. 20 is lost as waste with 13 of them being fecal matter. So how much is lost in urine? Well, waste was 20, so that included fecal matter and urine. 13 is just fecal matter, so the difference is seven. So seven is lost in urine. How much energy transferred to the sharks when I'm eaten entirely? So we will be solving for P. P is what the shark will get when he eats me entirely, bones and all. Okay, trophic level transfer efficiency. This is how efficient the energy transfer in trophic levels is. Obviously, trophic level transfer efficiency. Um, you divide the energy you get in the tr um, into the new trophic level over energy from the previous trophic level. So if it was um, a humpback whale eating krill, the humpback whale's energy is going to be at the top and its previous trophic level, what it just ate from will be the krill. So whatever energy the krill had will be at the bottom. If I'm eating a fish, Okay, my trophic level or my energy that I got from eating that fish is going to go at the top and the fish's energy is going to be below me. Multiply by 100. We'll practice this um, next week. It's, it's pretty simple. Um, when you're calculating energy transfer efficiency, typically it is around 10% of the next trophic level. 
but we, we did see that it's not perfect. So it does depend on how much food is eaten, how easy it is for the consumer to digest and use those nutrients. Typically plant material is a little bit easier to digest um, than like thicker meat material. How much energy do you use for movement? So, you know, if you are a very active person, you're really not going to yield as much energy for yourself. You're gonna be using a lot of it in respiration. How much energy is lost in waste products of, of metabolism? So whenever you're like breaking that down. Generally, it's easier to use energy from other consumers than producers. Does that completely negate what I just said? Moving on. Ectotherms and endotherms. Look at the sunfish. Look at that. I love it. I love it. I want to like tan on it. Just lay on it. Tan. Okay. Ectothermic. Ecto means outside, like your ectoparasite, but this is thermal, ectothermic. It's an organism that maintains its body temperature by exchanging heat with its surroundings. So it takes energy from its surroundings. The ocean sunfish will do this. Um, it does not use energy produced in respiration to keep its body temperature. Um, It, the water is typically warmer than what that fish is. So that's why the fish is like bathing in the sun. Um, we spend a ton of energy. So of the food that we eat, 90% of that energy goes to making sure we don't overheat and denature our proteins and cook our proteins and kill ourselves. And we don't get too cold. Because if we get too cold, our enzymes um, are going to slow down and everything in our body is going to slow down. So the biggest thing is that we can be homeotherms and we can maintain a temperature. We spend 90% of the energy we eat on that. It's a lot of the energy. A lot of the energy. Okay. So the sunfish typically is going to take on the temperature of the water around it, but it is not in like cold areas. Endotherms. These are organisms that maintain its body temperature. That's what we do. Generating heat in the meta in metabolic processes in respiration, making heat. Tuna expend their metabolic energy, maintaining a constant body temperature. And tuna can be in cold water and they can be in warm water because they maintain a body temperature. Um, if a shark was to feed on the sunfish and a shark was to feed on the tuna, even though the tuna has more mass than the sunfish, the sunfish is pretty flat, um, the shark is going to get more energy from the sunfish. Supposing that the sunfish and the tuna have similar amounts of energy, the shark is going to get more energy from the sunfish because they don't use their food and they don't use their energy to keep themselves warm. The tuna do. So there's less that go to the sharks with them. Um, is this on the next slide? Yes, it is. Okay. So I just said that small sharks will feed on tuna and the sunfish, which will provide more energy. Why? They're going to get more from the sunfish because the sunfish does not use its energy to keep itself at a certain temperature. It can exchange that with the its surroundings. Tuna maintain a body temperature, so they will constantly be using the food that they have to keep themselves at temperature. In general, feeding on endotherms, the energy transfer ranges from 1% to 5%. We are endotherms. Feeding on ectotherms, like your sunfish, the energy transfer is five to 15% because they are not using, they're not using as much energy to keep themselves a certain temperature. They don't do that. Almost over. Okay, so these are like bar charts, but they're horizontal. They are in a pyramid shape, but they are not like a triangle. And they're there to show a particular food chain or food web. Producers are always at the bottom. We do not show decomposers. We do not show an energy source. Okay, pyramid of numbers. 
pyramid of numbers shows you the relative amount of organisms in each trophic level. I don't need to read all of these. I know you can read it. Pyramid of numbers. If there were 200 parasites feeding on the shark, you would have a higher bar at the top. Now, it is hard to do this. Um, it's hard to keep it to scale because your phytoplankton might be in the millions because they are microscopic. Where your shark, you might only have like two sharks in this specific ecosystem. The horizontal bars need to be proportional to the amount that are in that trophic level. We should not have more predators than we do prey. However, we can have 200 parasites feeding on the shark because parasites are not a predator to sharks. They are a parasite to sharks. Um, this isn't super easy to do, though, because if producers are consumed really quick, and they are, um, once you count them, it could actually look like there's less than there are, and then the pyramid could look inverted. So it could look like we have smaller amount of phytoplankton here, and it could look like it's a little bit upside down. Like, how could you have so many organisms? It's, you know, it's inverted. I'll show you this one. Oh, hold on. I don't know if you can see. There we go. Okay. Mm, okay, so that's inverted. And the green is phytoplankton, the orange is zooplankton. But that's one of the issues with trying to do pyramid of numbers in a marine ecosystem. You're, you just can't. You can't, especially for your producers. Um, this number also changes depending on the time of year. You know, if fish are mating there, if fish are even there, you don't have whales everywhere you go. Um, there's, there's a lot of moving parts here. Pyramid of numbers do not take into account the size or biomass of organisms. Pyramid of biomass. It is not like a pyramid. Biomass is the weight of organisms with water removed. To do this, the organisms will be killed, so it's hard to measure the entire biomass in your food chain. Um, it's hard to find really legit ones. Because we would have to take all of our primary consumers, kill them all, put them in a little oven, and maybe like 110 degrees Celsius, <clears throat> evaporate out the water, or we could do it, yeah, about 110. And then that's what we're left with. But we have to kill the organisms to get their biomass. This is better to show um, like your trophic levels because it overcomes the difficulty of having organisms of various sizes. So like the parasites. What if 200 parasites are feeding on the shark? It's going to look large up here. But this does not take into account the size of organisms. However, it does not stop the issue of taking measurements after the organisms have been eaten. So we can't necessarily really tell what's true about this biomass if these organisms have been eaten. It'll add to the biomass of the trophic level above them. But this is a better way to show energy transfer than this. Pyramid of energy is going to be the best. Um, the best way to show energy. So it's a diagram that shows the amount of energy available to each trophic level. Um, it is 10%. That's how we're going to draw it. Unless you had um, specific values, trophic level transfer efficiency values, um, it's going to be about 10%. So it's a diagram that shows the amount of energy available to each trophic level. Your dry biomass is converted into energy production for that entire year. This is difficult to use, um, but it is useful in understanding your ecosystem and, and where your primary productivity is and how productive your ecosystem is. It's always a shape like this. I mean, it's not a real triangle. They are bars. Goodness gracious, great balls of fire. Oh my gosh, only almost an hour and a half. Okay, so hopefully you have had your notes done now. And so you're just gonna listen to me talk this out and then add to your notes i am checking it monday um and you're gonna have a test on october 2nd for chapter three um but next week we'll practice all of this stuff so have your notes done of course so that when you come into class it's useful and we can practice this information and you're not wasting your time bye guys have a good weekend